time has arrived. Um, so it is my pleasure to uh, open uh, the America's A session of, uh, of our conference. And uh, we begin with a lecture by Steve Gerben of, I see Brookhaven National Laboratories and Yale University, uh, Bosonic QEC codes and quantum simulations. Steve. Thank you very much, David. Yes, I'm, I'm wearing two hats today uh, uh, as a uh, temporary Brookhaven National Lab employee, as a director of the co-design center for quantum advantage, one of the five national quantum information science research centers recently funded by the DOE, and as a member of uh, the Yale Quantum Institute. So we've we've there have been plenty there have been and will be plenty of talks on bosonic quantum error correction. Codes. I'm going to give you a, a small um, uh, peek at some opinions I have about that, and then spend some time on quantum simulations. So um, the take-home message from my talk is that both quantum error correction and quantum simulations of physical models containing bosons are a lot easier on hardware that actually contains bosons. So uh, you can imagine different kinds of hybrid discrete variable continuous variable hardware architectures. There's these sort of, if I can call it, uh, traditional uh, discrete variable dominant uh, scheme in which you have, say, transmon qubits that are coupled by virtual photon exchange through quantum buses, bosonic resonators. And uh, uh, but there's a, an, an alternative, which is I call CV dominant, in which the quantum information lives not in the qubits, but in uh, harmonic oscillators, microwave resonators. What, but you, and then the things which were the qubits before become ancillas used for quantum control and coupling of these different um, bosonically encoded, possibly logically error correctable uh, bosonic qubits. So there are some benefits from this latter architecture that if your uh, uh, resonators contain standing photons that are encoding, uh, have error correctable quantum words, then you can readily out convert them uh, to flying uh, uh, photons and couple uh, different, you know, communicate, do quantum communication, remote entanglement, et cetera, within your uh, quantum computer. And then for longer distances, you can transduce these error correctable uh, code words from the microwave to the telecom wavelengths. Um, and it's all, and uh, the same, and both the microwave links and the optical links the uh, transmission of error correctable words, as Liang Zhang mentioned in his talk, uh, help you recover from uh, transduction errors and uh, losses in the uh, communication. Uh, so here you see, for example, an experiment uh, from the Yale group where uh, error correctable code words were prepared and transmitted from uh, Alice to Bob. And then the errors were detected, although not corrected in this experiment. Um, and uh, there's some deterministic phase rotation in these uh, Wigner function plots. Uh, but in the absence of a photon loss, which is detected by uh, parity measurements, you see good uh, transmission. And when the parity flips, you've detected uh, an error. So uh, a few words about quantum error correction, discrete variable, all quantum error correction is very hard. Discrete variable quantum error correction is especially hard because you have to make a logical qubit out of many physical qubits, each of which is subject to multiple types of <clears throat> errors. And the Maxwell demon, which is trying to correct those errors and pump the entropy out of the system, has to make many complex high weight error syndrome measurements to distinguish which of the three N possible errors occurred. 
And of course, from a fault tolerance point of view, the Maxwell demon is made of similar objects and makes its own mistakes. So the idea behind bosonic quantum error correction is not to use material objects at all as qubits, but use microwave photon states stored in very high Q uh, superconducting resonators. And there have been uh, many talks and will be more talks at this um, conference on these uh, topics and a discussion session on the GKP anniversary also today. So uh, I just want to cover one, what I find interesting point, which is a sort of apples to apples comparison between a discrete variable error correction code and a continuous variable error correction code, both of which are sort of minimal models that are designed to correct exactly the same uh, error channel, which is amplitude damping, and to do so uh, uh, to first order. So the first is the uh, four qubit amplitude damping code that was developed uh, by Debbie Lung and Ai Chuang and, and uh, Yamamoto in 1997. So there are four physical qubits. Uh, and uh, I'll describe the code in more detail shortly. And then uh, the simplest of the binomial bosonic codes uh, stored in uh, superpositions of photon Fox states in a weakly damped harmonic oscillator where the amplitude damping is just loss of photons. So here is, here's the direct comparison. The zero logical for the discrete variable code is 1100 plus 0011. It has uh, two excitations. The binomial code has photon Fox state two. There's an amazing symmetry between these codes. One logical is a superposition of zero and four excitations. The photonic case, one logical is a superposition of zero and four photons. The um, stabilizers that you need here are, sh are shown here, these weight two and weight four operators. The stabilizer you need for the um, oscillator case is very simple. It's just photon number parity because if you lose a photon, these even parity words will become odd parity uh, uh, error words. And uh, making quantum non-demolition measurements of these stabilizers in the discrete case requires, um, you know, multiple controlled not gates and uh, is presently challenging to do with high fidelity and Q and Dness. Parity stabilizer measurements in the photon case have been demonstrated with very high uh, Q and Dness and high fidelity. So let's look at the error models. They're both uh, amplitude damping for the case of the four qubit code there. Each qubit can de-excite. So there are four such possible error channels. And then the completeness relation, you know, for the Krauss operators tells us that there's a no jump evolution, uh, which is close to the identity, but uh, lowers the amplitude of, of uh, states that have more excitations than, than the average. The same is true over here, but here the excitation number is the number of photons rather than the number of excited qubits. And there's only a single uh, jump uh, uh, operator for photon loss. So this is why uh, this is simpler than this, essentially. And so um, the qubit code has four distinct places errors can occur, the oscillator only one, uh, and uh, the, the stabilizer measurement happens to be relatively easy to do in circuit QED, the boson parity. And uh, this is why to date uh, the small bosonic codes are doing better than small uh, qubit codes. And uh, there was a talk, which I assume occurred at three o'clock this morning, uh, my time <laughs> by Luyan Sun, demonstrating uh, experimental uh, uh, bosonic code error correction reaching 92% of, of break even. 
other bosonic codes like the CAT code and, and Rob Sholkoff's lab have slightly exceeded break even. Okay, so now I want to turn to, you know, in order to do this kind of error correction and in order to do quantum simulations, you need to have universal control of hybrid qubit oscillator systems. And so we're going to study a uh, transmon qubit coupled to a single mode of a microwave cavity. There, the cavity frequency and the qubit frequency are strongly detuned from each other so that you're in the dispersive coupling regime uh, shown by the, uh, represented by this term. And uh, Within this uh, dressed picture, the qubit state and the photon number are um, constants of the motion, provided that you neglect uh, damping, of course. So to control this system, to make these not constants of the motion, then you need a drive on the cavity with some amplitude and complex phase, and a drive on the qubit with some uh, Rabi amplitude and complex phase. And because of this, a uh, strong dispersive coupling where chi is say 3000 line widths, uh, then you can do, you can achieve universal control because you can do operations on the cavity conditioned on the state of the qubit. And you can do operations on the qubit conditioned on the number of photons in the cavity. So here's, here's one example that I often show, uh, taking the uh, uh, cavity with drives on it and drives on the ancilla transmon, uh, which are numerically determined from a grape algorithm after calibrating the Hamiltonian, and with little subsequent adjustment directly leads to a uh, transition from the zero photon state to the n equals six Fox state. Um, so that's relatively routine control these days. And uh, it's all done with optimal control theory pulse design. But as my uh, newfound computer science friend, uh, Nathan Weeb, keeps telling me, it's impossible to use um, design OCT pulses to run your entire stack. And we need to create an instruction set architecture for such hybrid systems, um, uh, if only so that computer scientists can reason about the software and algorithmic complexity of assembling that minimal instruction set into a full uh, algorithm. And so, of course, we have uh, unconditional ancilla gates, rotations of the ancilla independent of the state of the cavity. And we have unconditional bosonic gates independent of the state of the ancilla. We can do displacements very easily, uh, rotations of the bosonic mode in phase space are trivial uh, frame changes in software. Uh, we can do squeezing, two mode beam splitters, two mode squeezing. And then uh, there's this snap gate, which uh, through use of the ancilla, virtual use of the ancilla, you can apply an, an individually adjustable phase to each photon Fox state in the cavity. So that's a powerful toolbox. And then there are conditional gates, ancilla controlled cavity operations. Uh, so for example, a uh, controlled displacement gate in which you displace in phase space the oscillator a distance alpha if the ancilla is in state zero and some other distance, uh, say minus alpha, if the ancilla is in the one state. There are also conditional rotations, um, uh, which naturally come from the dispersive coupling Hamiltonian, and that can be used for parity measurements via phase kickback and parity measurements and displacements together can be used to do a Wigner function uh, tomography. And then there are cavity controlled ancilla operations. It's possible to rotate the state of the ancilla around some axis by an, uh, a given angle that only applies if there are exactly m photons in the resonator. 
and nothing happens. Uh, you get the identity in all other cases. So with this uh, tool toolbox, you can do arbitrary and universal non-Gaussian gates on the bosons and, and on the uh, full universal control of the combined system. And some examples of control displacements will appear in the next talk by Alec Eichbusch, who's talking about the uh, GKP quantum error correction. So that's universal control. There's also um, measurement, which is very important for tomography. And uh, so you could ask the question, is the photon number equal to one, yes or no? Is the photon equal to number equal to two, yes or no? Or 13, yes or no? And I'll, I'll show you some example where there are 256 possible uh, answers. And so if you just ask, is it one, then you know generically, most of the time, the answer will be no. It's not an information theoretic efficient sampling. And so you get a, a large query complexity if you're trying to find out what the photon number is. But uh, it's an interesting gate and it looks like this. So you have this condition, uh, cavity conditioned qubit uh, pi pulse that flips the state of the qubit from zero to one if and only if there are exactly m photons in the cavity. And the, the physical basis of this is this uh, dispersive coupling, and you just shine a pi pulse on the qubit tuned to the frequency that the qubit has when it's light shifted by exactly one photon. And that's how you produce this gate. Um, you could ask other questions. Is the photon number either equal to one or three, yes or no? And then you just simply apply two uh, tones in parallel that will flip the qubit if the photon number is one or three. So if the qubit flips, you will not know if it's one or three. You'll just know that it's one or the other. And indeed, by choosing other uh, drive tone sets, you can measure any arbitrary binary valued function of the photon number. So for instance, you can, you can carry out this operation, u vector c pi, where that vector c is a set of zeros and ones weighting the different photon number projectors. So this turns out to be a very useful gate because you can do a binary search to find the photon number, to measure the photon number. And it's carried out by this circuit shown here. And the, the corresponding uh, binary uh, labels are, are just the walsh hadamard transform of the, give you the walsh hadamard transform of the photon number. So if you choose this set of projectors, then this bit will, the ancilla will flip if and only if the photon number is in the upper half of the range of possibilities, say 256. And then uh, you make a measurement and you get one bit of information. Then you apply this second one, which will tell you whether given the answer to the first question, is the photon number in the upper or lower half of the remaining possibilities and so on down the line until the final measurement is just the photon number parity for giving you the least significant bit, bit in the binary representation of the photon number. And those individual bits are just determined by uh, these sums modulo two of the uh, measurement results. You need these sums because um, uh, this, if this gate flips the ancilla, then this measurement will be different from that result. So you add the two results mod two to see whether this flipped, flipped it or not. And so the circuit cost for this is logarithmic, only logarithmic in the maximum number of photons you can sample. And this is efficient boson sampling exponentially faster than that slow uh, RU0, RU1, RU2, RU3 uh, question that we started with. So using this control and measurement toolbox, uh, uh, we, can, we can do 
hardware efficient simulation of physical models containing bosons. And the example I'm going to talk about is experimental simulation of the optical spectra of vibrating molecules, which you can actually map onto a kind of boson sampling problem. Uh, the simplest version of which is shown here. Um, you input photon Fox states to a beam splitter array. The modes are, are, are coherently mixed together by all these beam splitters. And then you make number resolving measurements at the output. And uh, I'll give you a hint as to why the Frank Condon problem is related to this. So we're going to use bosons to simulate bosons in a hardware efficient manner. We're going to be talking about molecular vibrations of triatomic molecules and focusing on the symmetric stretch mode and the bending mode, the anti-symmetric bending mode. So by symmetry, these are different uh, independent ortho, um, normal modes. And we'll represent the number of vibrational quanta in each of those modes by the number of microwave photons in each of two resonators. And we'll control those resonators with ancilla transmons and an ancilla coupler uh, that brings them here. So the experiment will be to start in some initial state and then um, carry out the unitary transformation uh, associated with the absorption of a photon, which breaks one of these bonds, um, say the, this one, which then uh, destroys the nice symmetry of the molecule and mixes these two modes together in a way which I'll talk about. So you have a potential energy surface that the nuclei are slowly moving on uh, with coordinates describing the bend and the stretch. And that potential energy surface, uh, that energy is the energy in the rapidly responding electronic bonds in the molecule. And you start out in some state. And then when the photon is absorbed, you, you go to one of the bonds becomes uh, ionized or an electron goes to an antibonding orbital, then the potential energy surface changes dramatically. And you're in the sudden approximation, you project onto different final states, leaving different numbers of vibrations behind, which you can measure by because you need the energy of the laser has to provide those uh, vibrational, uh, that vibrational energy. So in this first generation experiment done by Chris Wang and Rob's lab, um, we, uh, we obtained the nuclear potential energy surfaces with the help of chemists uh, by solving the fermionic problem of the chemical bonds on a classical computer. Then we approximate the resulting nuclear potential energy surfaces as quadratic, as harmonic. And we assumed uh, the Condon approximation that the electronic transition dipole moment didn't vary strongly with the nuclear position. But we do allow different frequencies, uh, different spring constants, squeezing of the two modes, and orientation of the symmetry axes of the two modes, because uh, uh, the ground state, uh, you know, we already have by symmetry independent normal modes. But if one of the bonds is weakened, we break that symmetry and the resulting, the modes are mixed, which means this symmetry axis is rotated. And then we make the usual sudden approximation and the, and the simulation is to perform the unitary transformation between the eigenstates of the ground and excited state potential energy uh, surfaces or Hamiltonians. Uh, following this uh, procedure that the chemists developed uh, many years ago. So here's the circuit implementation. <clears throat> There's uh, uh, two cavities. There's a transmon coupler, and each cavity has their own ancilla. And you initialize everything in the ground state, and then you make some non-Gaussian state preparation to put a certain number of quanta in the stretch mode and a certain number in the bending mode. Then you carry out this Doctorov unitary transformation between the two potential energy surface basis states. And that's, uh, that's expanded here on the right. You see um, you have to squeeze cavity A 
squeeze cavity B. And then because the symmetry has changed in the excited state, you have to turn on a coherent beam splitter, which rotates the basis, you know, coherently mixes the two modes. Then you do another squeezing operation on A, another on B, and then you displace each of the two uh, modes. So that's the most general Doctorov transformation. At the end of this unitary, you uh, expect, you intended that the coupler transmon and the two ancilla transmons are all in their ground state. And so you do a verification step to look for error flags that if something went wrong, uh, a good with good probability, the uh, one of the ancillae will be left in an excited state. And we reject five to 10% of the data runs uh, because those flags go up. Then following that, we do a number resolving measurement in each cavity, uh, looking for up to uh, state zero through 15 in each cavity for a total of 256 possible measurement results. And we do that in two ways, either the uh, one photon at a time, is, there, is the photon number in the stretch uh, three and the photon number in the bend mode two? or we do the, bin the full binary search over the um, eight bits of information we need to find out which of the 256 states we're in. So here's the uh, experimental uh, results. So this is the, the theor theoretical results uh, from uh, classical computer calculations for what the distribution of 256, uh, roughly 256, uh, probabilities of leaving behind different numbers of quanta in each mode. This is for the case of photoionization of water starting in the vibrational ground state for the uh, symmetric stretch and the anti-symmetric bending. And they have some frequencies given in uh, inverse uh, centimeters here. Uh, the, of course, the frequencies in the simulator, the micro, uh, microwave cavities are completely different, but that, that doesn't matter. Um, and now, so here's the experimental data for the single bit measurement scheme where you ask, is there one excitation in cavity A and three excitations in cavity B and so forth? So it's very slow, but it's quite accurate. You can, you can, you can ask what is the distance between the theoretical probability distribution and the measured probability distribution. And one way to quantify that is the L1 norm between uh, the, the distribution, that is the probability that there are I photons in one mode and J photons in the other uh, between experiment and theory. And that L1 norm is about 5%. If you do the full efficient boson sampling, which is exponentially faster, exponentially in this case being uh, log two of 256, uh, 32, uh, it's, uh, the error is uh, worse, uh, but still uh, quite respectable for a first experiment, I would say. And, and the reason it's worse is because you have to do those four quantum dem demolition measurements in a single shot. Uh, keeping uh, keeping the whole system coherent during that time, which is harder to do than the single bit measurement. Uh, the Hamiltonian we actually have is not quite the one we want to simulate. There's a little bit of anharmonicity in the potential energy surface, and there's a little bit of photon loss. And if those were the only errors, then the, the the distance between the distributions would only be about one percent. So this is worse, but not wildly worse than that. Here you see photoionization of ozone uh, starting from some non-Gaussian state, one uh, one quanta in one mode and two quanta in the other mode. There are similar uh, fidelities but the shape of the spectrum uh, is completely different because of the different potential energy surfaces involved. So again, I wanna emphasize that these experimental results uh, would be difficult to obtain in um, uh, traditional uh, 
uh, quantum optics um, because typical photo detectors are not number resolving and their measurements are destructive. Here we have efficient quantum non-demolition single shot boson number sampling. P uh, quantum opticians are making progress on uh, transition dete edge detectors and so forth that can begin to resolve photon numbers, but it's still a challenge. Uh, as is uh, squeezing a bit of a challenge in traditional optics. So again, I want to emphasize we measure which of the 256 photon states the two cavities are in by making a quantum non-demolition measurement of eight bits, four bits describing the photon number in one cavity and four bits describing the photon number in the other cavity. And so the circuit complex complexity cost is log of this uh, maximum number uh, rather than linear. So it's a real exponential gain over the simplest uh, uh, protocol. Uh, also, it's interesting to ask, uh, you know, how hard would this to be to do on a conventional uh, qubit based quantum computer? And it would take, at, you know, at a minimum eight and actually more uh, qubits, at least a dozen. And to, to carry out um, that you represent the, the boson states uh, by several qubits, uh, you know, being in state 111 could represent photon number seven, for example. And uh, the, the gates that you would have to do to represent very simple things like the photon creation operator are very complex, and there would be of order a thousand high weight uh, qubit gates that would be required to do these simulations. So. Uh, obviously, we haven't achieved quantum supremacy at this small scale over the classical computations to which we're comparing, but in some funny sense, uh, <laughs> we have achieved quantum supremacy over all con existing conventional uh, quantum computers by using bosonic hardware. So, yeah, and it's not, it's not widely appreciated or as widely known that uh, bosons are also hard to simulate with qubits. We know fermions are because of the minus signs, but bosons are because of the multiple occupancy. And this, you know, you could use this uh, binary mapping between the photon Fox states and the qubits. Uh, but even something simple like the boson uh, destruction operator is very difficult operator to realize in uh, uh, this qubit case. It's got these funny irrational coefficients and sometimes one bit flips, in other cases three. Uh, and you have to do a, uh, uh, the, the which, w which bits flip is a complicated function of the state of all the bits. So this is very hard and unnatural to realize with qubits, but of course, completely natural operator available when you actually have bosons in your, um, in your processor. So for future directions, uh, Chris Wang is developing an experiment to try to study uh, conical intersections where the ground state potential energy surface actually intersects the excited state potential energy surface at a point. And it, where it goes gapless, of course, the adiabatic approximation for the nuclei moving on these surfaces breaks down. And uh, this process is uh, therefore more difficult to simulate uh, even classically. And it's an important process, for example, in the rhodopsin molecule that causes, that triggers uh, uh, your uh, optical nerve in your eye when a photon is absorbed and this, uh, the system funnels down through here and goes one way or the other way corresponding to detecting the photon or not detecting the photon. Uh, so that's in progress. And then, of course, we made a harmonic approximation uh, for the initial experiment, the situation with classic, the classical computational difficulty becomes much greater uh, in the anharmonic case. 
and uh, we need to be able to make certain um, conditional unitaries happen and, and do phase estimation in order to deal with that problem. And we're thinking about how to do that. Um, so in the last few minutes, I thought I'd briefly fantasize about the future of more general many body quantum simulations of interacting bosons. Uh, possibly working our way towards uh, the fractional quantum Hall effect for microwave photons. So can we somehow convince microwave photons that they are actually charged particles in a magnetic field? And if we could make the Laughlin state with filling factor one half in the lowest Landau level, we'd have uh, fractional photons, half photons that are abelian uh, semion fractional statistics. And if we could make the filling factor one uh, Laughlin's uh, more, uh, sorry, reed uh, uh, uh states for, for uh, bosons, then you'd have fractional uh, photon objects that have non-abelian statistics. So, uh, We've demonstrated, so I, I didn't emphasize that the, the two, the, the beam splitters that we turn on are frequency converting beam splitters because all these cavities have different uh, frequencies. And in the Frank Condon experiment, we just did uh, two of them. And you do that through four wave mixing and pumping. And uh, the next extension would then be able to phase lock those beam splitter pumps so that when a photon hops via the beam splitter around a closed loop, it picks up a non-trivial Arona foam phase as if it were a charged particle moving in a magnetic field. And this is kind of, in a way, Floquet physics not dissimilar from what uh, Ian Spielman and other cold atom people do to simulate um, gauge fields, but we have more local control here than uh, the cold atom people do with their lasers. Um, here you see, uh, you know, a single photon being swapped back and forth under the action of a beam splitter between two cavities. Uh, so that's been demonstrated, but extending it to, uh, you know, phase locked large sets of them needs to be done. We can use the snap gate that I talked about to impart of, uh, in, in um, a Trotter formalism, impart the Hubbard U phase evolution of the Hamiltonian to make the photons think they're re repulsive or attractively interacting. That's been demonstrated. But to really make a non-trivial simulation, uh, we'll need faster gates, longer coherence times, and control of large lattices. And uh, uh, Chris Wang is is uh, is building a three by three array uh, as the next as the first generation towards this uh, towards this goal. So uh, I want to thank the members of the Sholkoff lab with whom I have the privilege of working, and Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis led the. Frank Condon uh, experiment. Uh, we, you saw that we were, <laughs> had inverse centimeter frequency units. So that meant we were collaborating with actual chemists who taught us a great deal about uh, these molecules and, and Frank Condon physics. And I uh, also want to thank uh, the Devere lab with whom I also collaborate closely. So I'll stop there, take questions. Thank you. OK, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, we have uh, definitely enough time for questions, and uh, uh, I will first be looking at the chat. Uh, and I'm sure with a hundred of you, hundred of you online, uh, I will expect to see uh, many chats. But uh, the first one is there already. Um, a question from uh, uh, Shruti. Uh, let me summarize. I think this is something that, in a sense, you covered um, uh, in the. Uh, uh, the binary search, the uh, walsh hadamard search for, say, five photons, uh, the circuit is certainly more complex, and uh, the scheme would be more susceptible to photon loss. If this understanding is correct, do we eventually lose the log n advantage that you get from, uh, from using that uh, cleverer uh, measurement scheme? Uh, OK, that's a good question. So you, you, you get the. 
the most significant bit with uh, with high reliability. But then if there's an error somewhere here, the subsequent bits will be wrong. That's similar to what happens in uh, standard phase estimation. Although uh, one of the nice things about this scheme is, and you can do this measurement by phase estimation, but this scheme actually, there's no feed forward. You don't have to make a decision. You just take the final results. But it is true that um, you know, if if you, you you'll you'll get decreasing accuracy on the on the smaller, the le less significant digits, um, and um, at least it's on the less significant digits. That's good. Uh, but uh, of you know, if you had a larger number of modes or a larger uh, total. Uh, cutoff number on the photon number, you'll have to do more measurements and you'll, your accuracy will, will go down. Okay. I don't know if that quite answered the question, but. Um, I'll throw in the thought now that uh, uh, everyone who, all you 21st century types can switch on to Slack later to uh, discuss these uh, things uh, at greater length. Uh, let me move on to the next uh, question that's come on to the chat from uh, Shyam. Could you expand? on why it is impossible to use only OCT and to have a discrete set of gates. Ah, well, so this is uh, my education in computer science. This is the computer science point of view that uh, Nathan Weeb is slowly uh, inculcating me with. So if you have, um, uh, uh, you know, thousands of, if we're successful in building big scale systems and have 100,000 qubits and, and um, uh, many resonators and lots of quantum parts, then uh, you don't want to, it, it would be very, very hard to optimize the control pulses to do every possible, you know, algorithm that you want your system to run, every possible set of gates. You need to uh, abstract you know, modularize things, you need to hide some, all the, the, what the electrons are doing from the computer scientists and give them uh, a slightly abstracted uh, instruction set so that they can um, uh, reason about uh, how many gate operations within the tool set it takes to perform a given algorithm. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I'm going to ask, uh, actually get to ask my own question. Um, just one or two things about the actual molecular physics of these uh, uh, triatomic molecules. Um, so you always, you labeled your axes as uh, photo, you know, photo cross section or something like that, which I guess implies that after the photo excitation uh, up to these uh, uh, excited uh, manifolds, there, there is actually a tunneling of the electron, or finally, there's tunneling of the electron out. So then, in actual molecular physics, what you detect is a is an escaping electron. Uh, yes. So yeah. if it were done with a high energy photon, the electron will will just leave. It won't tunnel. It's just blasted out of the molecule at high energy. But the amount of en kinetic energy with which it escapes uh, will be less if you leave behind many vibrations. Yeah, okay. So so if it's optical absorption, then you need to just tune the laser frequency to conserve energy. If you send in, you know, an X-ray or an ultraviolet photon and really rip the electron out, then you have to measure the remaining kinetic energy in the, in the, um, okay. in the electron. Okay, so this, this sounds like indeed an uh, ultraviolet kind of, you know, the area of physics we're talking about is ultraviolet spectroscopy. And it seems to me this can actually be measured, right? Uh, uh, is, is that not the case or these, these actually can't be measured? Uh, oh, no, this is, th these types of measurements are uh, routinely used to try to identify molecules in, a, in, a, in the gas phase in, in an un right. you know, unknown sample. They're, it's used all the time. Um, the, now, of course, you can't prepare, you can't do the initial state preparation that you, uh, that you use here. You, well, not very well, although you could imagine if it's 
cold uh, doing a, a two pulse experiment where the first pulse, if you have quantum control, could prepare a state. But it, yeah, it's that's actually typically you imagine some thermal ensemble of initial states. Okay, but in short, uh, there are there aren't data sets of this exact picture uh, from actual measurements on water. Um, I don't. Actually, I should know that. I don't think so. The chem the chemist didn't uh, didn't provide us with that, but I'd better check. That's a sort okay. of fundamental thing I should know the answer to. All right. Well, I'm a little off track because this is a GKP conference after all. Uh, right. Let me. Take, there's one more in the chat, and I have time uh, for just this. I think. Um, for how many degrees of freedom would you need to simulate Frank Condon factors to achieve quantum advantage over classical computers? Uh, so that's a somewhat complicated question, which uh, sampling experts, sampling complexity experts like Shruti might be able to better answer. But there have been rough estimates that it's pretty big, maybe um, it, uh, 50 modes with some number of quanta to be specified in the initial state. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's mm -hmm. something. Uh, we don't anticipate being able to, we haven't thought hard about it because we don't think we would be close to that in, in the near future. Mm -hmm. But in print, but it, but uh, you know, Scott Aronson and company have defined that as a, um, a task with which you could uh, in principle uh, demonstrate that you've achieved quantum supremacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so on behalf of the hundred or so people sitting very, very quietly around the world listening, uh, I thank you for, uh, for your lecture and uh, we will move on. Uh, I will silently uh, clap.